Today's show is brought to you by Stream Tech Drift Boats, the world's most versatile drift boat. Find them at www.streamtechboats.com. I kind of feel bad for these people, but at the same time, I don't because they're stupid. You <laughs> <laughs> see a circle around yourself, just start pissing everywhere. Oh, I hate the Dutch. <laughs> Welcome to our country. And so. She looks. She doesn't really look Canadian. She looks almost American. <laughs> we salted all of Canada. <laughs> <laughs> oh, every time I see something, something you got. <laughs> if I had known that before, I would have just like interspaced every other sentence with something horrible. Well, I haven't yeah. felt my feet since I sat down in the chair. <laughs> Can you see your feet, though? Uh, no. You know, I'd rather do anything else on the planet than go tip a cow over. <laughs> How about Canada? Is there any stream access issues up in Canada? Nobody cares. Very much. <laughs> Kids, if you don't understand that joke, ask your parents. Evan, Derek? Yeah. Oh, correct. Here it comes. Your flies are open. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Grab hold of your flies. This is a podcast for nymphers, strippers, swingers, and dry fly guys. It's the show that brings you stories, instruction, and conservation from three guys who live it every day. This is The Open Fly. Good good start. (laughs) Well, Kirk, are you living it today? I'm, I'm living the dream. I'm supposed to live it every day. Living it. Otherwise, it's false advertising. Yeah. yeah. I'm living the dream. Well, that table's a little slicker than I thought it was going to be. Yeah. Well, Great. I'll make them like they used to. Cool. So how was your last week, Kirk? You were doing special things until last night. Yes. I don't want to brag. I don't want to seem ingrateful. But um, I was in Hawaii for a week. Mm. and I'd- A room with a view. A room with a view of the dumpster. It was a garden view room, um, but I had a connection with the working man on the island of Maui that none of our other travel companions had. They all they all looked out at the ocean. I looked out at the dumpster. <laughs> so I yeah. got no complaints. Well, I mean, on an island, there are a bunch of sides. There's at least four sides, right? So no matter, that was bound to happen. You had a chance of it. Some, Yeah, yeah. And mm-hmm. quite frankly, I didn't spend a whole lot of time in the room. Uh, anything exciting happen at the dumpster? Any fires or? Um, no, no. No dumpster uh, fires. No dumpster fires. You know, the garbage guy came and went, and with the rhythm of the ocean, mm-hmm. uh, UPS truck pulled in and had a delivery one day. Um, Did anybody try to put trash in the recycle bin? No, no, I don't think anybody was that. <laughs> you know, they're pretty strict about that in Hawaii. Yeah, uh, well, yeah. They, you think they're strict about it in Seattle? I think Hawaii might rival them. Mm. But it was uh, it was pretty special. It was a touristy vacation. Yeah. I wasn't over there to did fish. You, uh, did you book that room for the next few years? Just get that one on lockdown. I actually bought that room. Good, <laughs> good. Time's got a great timeshare <laughs> deal in it. Yeah. So anyway, uh, it took me fifty-two years to get to Hawaii. I thought you'd been there before. Is that Derek that goes there like every year? I've never been. Hmm. Seriously? I thought you'd been there like a lot of times before. Never. Really? First time. Mm-hmm. Well, my friend just built a house there, an Ocean View room in Kona, and I have an open invite, so. Oh, yes. And he fishes Isn't a lot. Isn't it good to be you? Did you come back with those flowers that go around your neck at all? A lay? Uh, Did you get laid? Get laid. Well, that's a personal question. No. <laughs> <laughs> I saw turtles and whales and I like turtles. little bright colored reef fish. Yep. Interestingly, uh, we did go snorkeling on uh, Oluwalu Reef. And How do you spell that? O L O W A L U. I always wonder what a Hawaiian spelling bee would be like. Oh. <laughs> Some of those words. Oh, it's pretty simple, <laughs> like though. 30, like a lot of those words are like 30 letters long, and they're just like repeat the same thing over and over again. Yeah, if you get into the rhythm of the first, you know, uh, it's like if you took absolutely. Mississippi times 10 and changed the S's for L's, you'd have Hawaiian words. Yeah, exactly. It's it's pretty cool. <laughs> well, that, that's a kind of a nice little segue into some feedback we got about our last show, isn't it? Uh, it's Well, it's kind of a summary of feedback we get after every show. Yeah. Kirk, do you want to summarize for us? You're the feedback guy. We can in your, your theme song. Um, I really don't have any idea what we're talking about right now. You had one job, Kirk. <laughs> it's your part of the show, dude. <laughs> feedback. <laughs> Kirk's been checked out. Kirk's still checked out. You flew in how many hours ago? We got in last night at uh, about 8.15. Mm-hmm. 
Pacific Standard Time. Pacific Standard Time. Here and it's now. Ladies. We are. I'm, it's like quarter after ten Pacific Standard Time now. So yeah, we were we were home by nine thirty by the time we did everything. Hmm. Got well, up early this morning. Had to go fetch my pooch out of the boarding facility. Mm. Unpack your flip flops and your swimsuit and t shirts, yeah. and you were done. Huh? Yeah. That's the nice thing about going to Hawaii. I went to Denver this week. That was for work. How was the weather? Uh, all over the place. Oh. <clears throat> It was like 20 degrees and snowing to 60 degrees and sunny. and All in the course of like three or four days? Three or four hours. Oh. Ooh. Cool. Yeah. How was the weather back home, Derek? Was it foggy here a lot? Yesterday, yesterday was, yesterday really was a, gorgeous. We had some fog. We had sun a couple days in a row that were just, yeah, really nice. Hmm. Yeah. Anyway, how about feedback? Yeah. Okay, I guess I'll summarize and I'll let Kirk uh, right. say something. Yeah. Uh, no, it seems like after every show-ish... We get at least one message on Facebook or email or something uh, pretty much along the lines of, so why was that your guest for this topic? Or, mm-hmm. yeah, nice nice show, but you should have talked to this guy instead. Yeah. And, I mean, you could, I mean, the reason why it's after every show is because that's pretty much always the case. Um, it's feedback, it's feedback not feed forward. Not feed forward. Yeah. <laughs> no, just meaning. Uh, that's the Kirk I was looking it, for right there. Now you own it. Now you own it. You got it. You know, like, <laughs> we, we don't really... We don't really pick our guests based on them being like the top authority on every on every topic. Right. It's just it's who we can afford on the sh- to yeah. get on the show. <laughs> right. yeah. I just I don't see a reason to do that. Everybody that's on the river uh, guides, uh, conservation people, whatever they all got a story, and that's what we're here for. We're not here yeah. to just take the cream of the crop. We're we're scraping the bottom of the barrel. That's kind of our thing. Yeah. No, we're not. <laughs> well, yeah. I, I I would say that. To that as well is that everybody has to have a voice. So if right. you don't like it, you don't have to listen. No, yeah. and and again that takes us back to the old contact us. If you got somebody that you think we should know about, and sometimes the show, they do, yeah. and then I try to contact that person they suggested and never hear back. Yeah. That's why we don't go for the cream of the crop. We're those not are, good enough. Those are. I mean, I, you see those suggestions come in. They're like, okay, good. Those are. That's a nice guideline perhaps of the direction right. people want the show to go and sometimes we're on that tack and sometimes we're not so yeah, we like to dance with the girls with low self-esteem right yeah there you go no i, I i've liked all the guests we've had on i think everybody's I got a i think everybody's got a story whether they've just started guiding they guide three times a year mm-hmm. or if they've been doing it for 20 30 years everybody's got a story they're all stewards of the resource absolutely we're not above anybody no so yeah um, yeah, so there. Yeah. The reason why we booked that guy is because fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> there you go, quack. Yeah. Anyway, right. yeah, contact us, though. If you get somebody on your radar that should be on our radar, get off your lazy ass and mm-hmm. contact us, please. Mm-hmm. Thanks. Yeah. So that's that. All right. Did, did you have any other summary feedbacks you want to, I don't know, I didn't, I didn't copy-paste right. any to send to you this time. Pretty sure we I can just make one up. Nothing. I got nothing. Good. All right. All right. Well, things I've actually had a few feedbacks since the last show, and yeah. I failed to it's, put them all together. It's part of the loop, but you start taking, you know, you start telling us what cogs, what the cogs should look like, then in the wheel, then yeah, it becomes well, mm-hmm. then it might come your show. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Don't tell me how to do my job. Mm-hmm. It's not really a job. It isn't really a job at all, isn't it? Not anymore. We're vol- I mean, we're volunteers at this, <laughs> yeah. thing, aren't we? Right. It was kind of a job a year ago, and we were doing this like once a week. Yeah. Yeah. We're but still philanthropists. Anyhow, yeah. Yeah. We're still doing good things. Uh, kind of on that topic, uh, up until the end of December, we were accepting monthly donations uh, for the show. I actually halted that for now. I'm going to put it on hold for a little bit because I feel like if we're only doing one show a month, you're not really getting your money's worth, so... And the temptation to uh, pocket that money was just yeah, too great for it was. Him, so, I mean, we're just sitting on tens of thousands of dollars. <laughs> I wish. <laughs> no, we, we've got plenty of money here to, to run our, our monthly costs and, and all that. So I just, while we're, while we're kind of in a slow time doing one show a month or so, uh, I just don't see a reason to take people's money in exchange for shows. So there you have it. We'll never be good politicians. Mm. Nope. Nope. <laughs> well, okay. Are we paying interest at all? On? Did you get a good rate for us to bank somewhere with all that multi-million dollars? Or no? Yeah. Our student loans. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Cool. 
Oh yeah. Okay, oh, yeah, so I, I'm I'm investing it. So that's our show for the day. Yep. <laughs> well, thanks for listening. Bills are going. Lights are going off. Oh. No, Derek, are you uh, getting in on this trade show season at all? No. No? Nope. Not even the one here in town? Uh, I will go and be present at the one in Linwood. Yeah, all right. Absolutely. And, Kirk, you got asked to do some podcast presentation or something, didn't you? Yeah, some media-type uh, presentation. And Did I... they not know that you had two co-hosts, too? Well, I, fig- I think he maybe thought that you guys might be busy working the show. So I, I emailed him back and uh, said, hey, we're all three available and going to be up there. Mm-hmm. I haven't heard back from him yet. That was Who'd nice. you talk to? Uh, Steve Duda. I don't know who that is. It was like two weeks ago. Fly, so. oh. Flyfish Journal. Okay. Yeah, Steve, check your Facebook Messenger thing. Mm-hmm. Anyway. Oh, so where's that going to be at? The Linwood, Washington show? Yeah, Linwood, you know, North King County. Yep. Mm. Cool. Yeah. So if you're going to that show, Kirk will be giving a presentation. And Derek and Evan will be. I'll right be around. Right be there. Around, yeah. 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 It's, I'll all about, it's all about you. I mean, the backbone of the show. <laughs> <laughs> Where would BB without your feedback segment? <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, I just started at, at the show in Denver this week. So yeah. I actually got to meet quite a few fans. Like, it's weird saying we actually have fans. Yeah. You know, people that enthusiastically come up and shake your hand. They and, throw their shirts at you. Oh, absolutely. Oh, God. You don't even know. This is a public service announcement. I hope people were listening in their sarcasm font for the last five or six minutes or so. For. Just that was all just sarcasm, right? Which what was? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Oh. yeah. We, it's actually a very. We actually have a very important show today. So perhaps that's oh, like a more really, important than previous shows. No, I said. Did I say that? No, they're said, all important. I said a very important show today. Okay, Derek, what have you been up to? A little uh, slaying any sp- hogs? Spearheading of uh, a new TU chapter by chance? Yeah, oh, there's, yeah. Works too. there's that. And that's cool. The Yakima Headwaters chapter yeah. of the. Uh, the Trout's Unlimited. Is this your brainchild? Did it you is, come up with it? It is my brainchild. All right. This is big. So, this is your uh, your opus. I don't know about that. Well, up to this date, maybe it's your opus. Well, it could be. There could be bigger magnum opuses. Bigger. Give everybody a summary in 100 words or less. So the head, pardon me, the headwaters of the Yakima are you know, critical spotting habitat for a number of important species. I um, lost count. One close to me is West Slope Cutthroat up there. And um, if you fish the Upper River a lot, it may be for you as well. So um, there's not necessarily a, a footprint for TU on the ground up in the, the headwater. So um, that's what we're starting. Cool. So this is going to be a community focused chapter. And a key designation to remember is that TU doesn't have fishing clubs. We have we have chapters, and this is an organization. So it's going to be um, it's going to be organized. <laughs> Sweet. Yeah. Right so on. we've got a fundraiser uh, kickoff informational meeting on the 21st of January. So, I'll be in New Jersey. I'm sorry. Yeah, well, we'll be at the Brick in Roslyn. So from 5 until 10. Drinking the beer. Yeah, and uh, I've got a great um, complement of donations for the for the raffle, for the fundraiser, So including some stuff from Alan. So, no, it was from Exteris. Exteris, sorry. Yeah, Exteris, which is part of Alan. Which is part of Alan, okay. Yeah, but our listeners probably don't know about right. Exteris yet. Guided, but they will. Guided float trips from local guides, um, fly boxes, flies. I mean, you name it. There's there's a bunch of cool stuff that people that you know fish and recreate use. So come on out and make so, a donation, and your money's going to go to good things. Nice. Yeah. So. Rumor has it they might be able to pick up a set of children's fly fishing books as well. Oh, and I do have actually confirmation on that as we speak. Oh, yeah. So thank you to all of the Wooly Booger for a donation as well. Bugger. Bugger. It's bugger. 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 Um, so, yeah. But then on with the vein of the show today, we've got two pretty important topics as well. So one of them, we're going to talk with uh, Jess McLaughlin. McLaughlin really quick here in a couple minutes. Um, she is a uh, fantastic photographer, uh, blogger. Uh, a voice in the fly fishing industry from a, a number of different perspectives, but, um, you know, from a woman's perspective. And so we're going to talk about that today in the industry. Um, weaving that in with, um, it's sort of a guide story segment as well, because she spent a lot of time around folks on the river. So we're going to talk about the parallels between, you know, photography and, and fly fishing industry and from a bunch of different perspectives. And I think it's going to be a pretty, a pretty good discussion. Has potential. Has potential. Yeah, we'll see what we do with it. It yeah. might result in other clicks and likes and shares and comments further down the road. Holy crap. Ooh, I know. It's next level stuff. Yeah. Forward thinking. Forward thinking. And then what is after that? This is a two-guest show. This is a two-guest show. And after that, we've got um, a gentleman that I've met a couple of times by the name of Wade Felon. 
you know, yeah, waiting and filling. Funny, funny every time. Every time. <laughs> funny every time. But it's a serious. It's a serious topic. Um, he's a, a smart young guy that um, is uh, starting up a, a foundation or a riverkeeper program for uh, the Upper Missouri. In Montana, so kind of the Montana. same kind of deal you're starting. It's it's very very similar. Did yeah. you get the idea from him? I did not. Oh. There are a number of other examples that are like this, but that's what's that's what's needed right now. Hmm. There's stuff to do, and there's got to be people to do it. So that's what this is about. Hmm. Um, so kindred yeah. kindred spirits. Kindred you spirits. Are. Yeah. yeah Wade fell in, and Derek Wade. fell over, or something like that. You can quack that one out. That was poor. That was poor. So let's take a quick break. And then um, come back with with Jess. Okay. Let's just get this out of the way now, Kirk. Where are we going? You know, I, I don't have a clue. <laughs> just <laughs> we're going to turn the mics off and just it hang is. out for a few minutes, regroup. Yeah, think about okay. what get we our heads said. again. Yeah, Which, um, on the way out, just knock on HR's door. Just <laughs> just pop in, and say hi. <laughs> <laughs> right. Ooh, that's never a good. Well, I am going to go get some, myself some more coffee. Probably with uh, we're going to throw a little something in there. Spice it. Up. I know the guys from Montana said they would be drinking. It's already happy hour there, too. So yeah. Yeah. we're in good shape. Got to catch up. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. Aloha. All right. So in what? Three, two, one. This is Derek, and on behalf of Stream Tech Boats, I want to talk to you about three factors that I consider really important when you're choosing a drift boat, and that's safety, fun, and performance. These are the safest drift boats around to float out of. They're fun to row, and from a performance standpoint, if you're a professional on the water, all three of these factors are important. So let's take a second to hear from the man who designed the boat himself. I tried pretty much everything, but just none of them were really doing what I wanted. So we set out to design a boat. I'd call it the one, the one boat that would maneuver like the hard boats, that would go in the really rough places, that would float high, that would have all the amenities that come on a hard boat with anchor systems and good leaning. A very nice flat floor that you can inflate hard, that you can stand on. No bolts, no nuts, no pins, no clips, nothing to put it together. The reasons that it's so good for fishing, it's got this rocker and so it pivots quickly and it slides out on the foam pile when you come off big drops. That rocker just climbs right out on the foam pile. A total game changer. So there you have it. My recommendation, Link's words. Look for us at www.streamtechboats.com. Call Link directly. He'll answer that phone and he'll get you on your way towards the best drift boat on the market. Now back to the open fly. And we're back. All right. Let's go. I, we covered that before we left. Oh, that's right. Yeah, I actually didn't even leave the room. Right. <laughs> but a lot has happened uh, during the break. Yeah, I accidentally poured a cup of coffee that's half whiskey. Yep. And we uh, we now dialed in our first guest. Awesome. Jess McLaughlin from Vermont, which is like on the far side of the continent from where we are. Yep. Yep. That's so we have to yell. On the far side. The far yeah. side. Can you hear us, Jess? <laughs> it's, it's a long I wire. Totally. Yep, yeah. it is a long way. <laughs> you don't yeah. sound Vermont. Oh. Yeah. I'm not. I'm actually a Montana kid. Yeah. Um, and swore I would never, ever live in the Northeast. And uh, got recruited to come out here about a year ago. And here we are today. Have you tried the maple syrup? <laughs> I have. I think you can't be here very long without doing the maple syrup thing. And there's a suspiciously good amount of craft beer as well, so that oh. helps. Oh, I hate craft beer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it awful. depends on alcohol content. It works. No, it's yeah, great. I've got a I, – I brew my own beer and have a, a uh, yeah. tap system here with multiple of my own beers on tap. And that's kind of – yeah. Very nice. The craft beer thing's how I do things. Cool. Cool. Other well, than fishing, it's my other thing I do. Where uh, <laughs> where in Montana are you originally from? I'm from Kalispell, so okay. that kind of far northwestern corner. Um, probably the one of the lesser areas in terms of fishing, but there's still some good stuff around. And I've I've worked on the Missouri and done time in Bozeman and Missoula and Billings, so it bounced around a bit. Sure. Mm-hmm. So cool. what took you out to Vermont? You said you got recruited. What um, what was that all about? For Orvis, actually, it's they wanted a. Oh, they're uh, in Vermont. 
They're in Vermont. Yeah, it's we're way up here in the very cold, snowy northeastern corner today. Um, and they need a new outdoor copywriter. And small world. It's I ended up coming out here to interview and fell in love with the place and some of the people. And it's a good thing. So it's in the ironically the first female copywriter for the outdoor category that Orvis has had in what over 150 years oh. so it's it's very much a fun role to be in in that oh. regard kind of a groundbreaker yeah yeah, yeah. awesome yeah. Well, yeah they took a risk on the you know kind of the wild kid from montana so i'm very very grateful to them for that but it's, it's a good crew of folks. it's been at least 150 years since this show has had a, a female <laughs> co-host so yeah Maybe we All need right, to follow suit. Go. It's good inspiration there, isn't it? Yeah. Well, I hope that Orvis can stay in business <laughs> yeah. um, and that you can keep your job. Yeah, for a while. it's a hard life. Like I know. Like well, hey, it's, they were like on me to sell fishing, so it could be dangerous. Smart <laughs> hires. <laughs> Jess, how else do, um, do people know you? You've got a couple of different things going on with photography and writing as well, right? Definitely. Yeah, I do. I run a, um, for I guess six years now, I've run my own freelance photography and writing business. And uh, still continue to do that full time. So it's today's are a mix of a lot of coffee and very little sleep. But so far it's working. It's pretty fun. I like so, coffee. Um, coffee is my friend. I enjoy it a lot. <laughs> Probably too much. And the name of that is. Did we already hear blog, that? U- uh, blog URL? Go ahead. <laughs> plug plug yourself. Oh <laughs> uh, yeah, it is. No, no, but seriously, we're we're. we're, we're <laughs> What do people look for when they want to look you up and look at your uh, your photography and your stuff and things and whatnot? Oh, totally. It's Firegrass Photography. There you go. Um, Write that down, folks. We lose it? It's fun. It's a mix. I'll, I'll warn folks right now a lot of my business is fishing related, but it's I've worked with the military and I've worked with wildland fire crews, and there's a lot of kind of random things on there. So browse with caution, so I guess. So Fire Girl. Browse uh, with caution, meaning like not safe for work. No, fire girl. Um, it's an old childhood nickname, actually. That stuck around. I had a an odd childhood fascination with forest fires. Uh, Northwest Montana is a good spot for that, I guess. Uh, we had a real big one this year. In the... Let her talk. Oh, about... really? <laughs> this isn't yeah, about finish. you. Finish. <laughs> Sorry, I'll stop talking. I'm going to mute my mic here. Oh, you're good. <laughs> oh, I. I... It sounds kind of bad. I enjoy. It. I love photographing forest fires. You know, I enjoy them. It's. I. I think it's kind of a symbiotic thing. You know, in the end, they're often good. So, I don't know. Childhood name that stuck around, and I didn't want to be one of those fire crews in my business after myself. So that kind of rolled around, I guess. Are you redheaded? I'm not redheaded. Mm. It would be a lot more fun if I was. I think it would fit the name better. Well, yeah, it's all right. And yeah. then, then yeah, also. Yeah, and then also a blog, correct? There is. There's a very creatively named Fire Girl Photography blog. Um, and then I write for several online sites as well. Uh, Chi Wolf is a fly fishing blog that I write for. I do a weekly column for them and other odds and ends. So it's it's a lot of a lot of fun. It keeps me very busy, which yeah. is nice. Nice. So fair to say you are fairly involved in, in the fly fishing industry then. That's That's fair to say. I would say so. Yeah. I think that's legit. And surprising that she could take time out of her busy schedule to be here with us right now. <laughs> yeah, take note, other important people. <laughs> <laughs> hey, it's, you guys are a priority, trust me. Well, I, I first met you, I guess, a couple of years ago now in Craig at, um, at Headhunters in the fly shop working behind the counter and just, just um, sparked up a conversation and stayed in touch ever since. So there? I appreciate you coming on the show. Right here? Do you meet her there? That The hat you're wearing, Craig. Yeah. There you, or Kirk. Yeah. You're calling Craig? I call him Craig. <laughs> Craig Montana. Craig Montana. So, Craig Montana, the infamous Craig. Yeah. So the question that's always been on my mind is, um, what parallels do you see with um, your photography work and fly fishing in terms of your role and how it, how it's grown? Have you seen similarities or are there big differences in, in what you do in terms of things like politics and, and getting jobs done and getting getting your name out there? Um, it's Things have certainly, it's been a very good year. Um 2014 was great. 2015, actually, the first quarter right now is shaping up to be uh, the busiest yet. It's extremely busy, and I'm starting to do more work overseas, which is fantastic. I've, um, as you guys definitely know, fly fishing is a very, very tight knit community. So it's um, it's it's insular. Once you're in it, it seems like you're in it for better or worse. Some some days it would be nice to take a break from it. Um, 
and also, she goes, no, it's run by a bunch of very, very strong personalities. Um, I'm the exception good. to that rule. <laughs> oh, of course, of course. Evan is a man of weak character. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just there. Oh. In a sea of strong-minded individuals. I'm the also-ran. <laughs> Every, everybody gets a trophy. Everybody gets a trophy. <laughs> nice. Carry on. Um, but no, I've, I've met some of the most incredible people in the sport. It's it's ironic to me. I was just done in uh, Belize doing a photo shoot for Orvis this November and actually got into photography with an eye towards uh, conflict photography, towards war photography. And that's that was where my heart was. I think it's still – I'll still get there someday. That's very much what I would like to do as a career. Fly fishing has been a very weird sidestep. Um and I met a guy down in Belize who is a, a national project director for a fisheries conservation group down there. And we were talking about, from his perspective, you know, that, that fishing does tend to be an insular group. And down there, it's sustenance fishing. Um, people make their living selling their fish and feed their families. But he said, hey, you know, think of it in a bigger scale. It's, his best friend was killed a couple of years ago in a fisheries dispute. And that, coming back to the States and thinking about that, it brought both a lot of gravity to fishing as a whole. And then um, it makes it a lot easier to kind of laugh at the the political odds and ends in, in our, you know, fly fishing community here and be like, hey, you know what? It's really not that big a deal. Um, I guess it puts things into perspective. Yeah. So it's it's great community, but I think folks tend to get their hackles up often and get wrapped up in it. And, um, you know, it helps to step back and from the photography angle and from just the, the fishing angle, although it's kind of a rare day to actually get out from behind the camera and fish. Mm-hmm. Um, just step back and say, hey, at the end of the day, we're like, we're throwing string with a fly on the end and catching slimy things. <laughs> yeah, we got, we got first world problems. <laughs> Totally. We have very much first world problems. And it's, um, you know, it's always kind of good to remember that and be like, hey, it's most of us make our careers in fishing. And that's awesome. It pays the bills. But it's still definitely, as you said, first world problems. Yeah. One of the things that we were accused of early on that we quickly tried to quash was that we were we were instructional in some way on this podcast about fly fishing. And we I think we quickly killed that. But it, it is a uh, good riddance. It, yeah, it is a tendency, um, especially in social media these days, to. Um, you know, when someone posts a picture about fish handling or someone posts a, a picture of something they've done or how they've done it. Uh, mm-hmm. and I think, I think I've been guilty of it a couple of times myself of, no, you've done it wrong. This is the way you need to do it. There are some times where that's oh, warranted sure. though. Yeah, yeah. I mean, some of the, the bull trout yeah. pictures that we saw recently, yeah. you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. yeah. That, that deserved it. So, you know, that, mm-hmm. that happens because, um, you know, why do you think that happens versus maybe the photography industry that, that maybe does give feedback in a more um, professional way? Or is there just some, some growth? Is this growing pains that fly fishing is going through from your experience? Or or what are your thoughts? Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's photography can be a powerful tool. and just kind of saying, hey, guys, let's – you do have photo proof one way or another and say, look, this is correct, um, almost as a best practices tool. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we're seeing Kurt Dieter started the, the keep them wet hashtag that I've seen floating around. You know, instead of the traditional grip and grin – keep the fish in the water and, you know, really soon quickly and just minimal handling, which I think is an awesome thing. I mean, kudos to him for doing that. It's, it's preserving the research that we all enjoy. And, um, I think training at the next generation is huge. I mean, I, I had a group out this fall of female anglers who had never held a fly rod before and just went and did a, a brief instructional for them. And they, number one, didn't want to touch the fish because they thought it was, I don't, there was, who knows? It's icky. But we're very much, yeah, I guess it was icky or would bother their, their nail polish or, or something. Um, but they just were very, they were interested in the sport, but had no idea of proper ethics and had all gone out with boyfriends or husbands prior and had never learned about, you know, oh, maybe here's, here's why we do this. You know, the bigger picture instead of like, hey, let's go catch dinner for these guys. So I think at all levels, starting people out just as kind of a, Hey, here's our best practices. It's, um, you know, I grew up catch and release. But that being said, I've definitely caught lake trout before and said, okay, that's dinner. Yeah. Um, so I think it's, and that will depend on the individual and that will depend on situation and all kinds of things. But if folks can kind of step back and say, hey, at the end of the day, how can we preserve the sport for our kids? That's just healthy for the sport. 
Right. Yep, that's a natural progression. You know, with with most exactly. with most activities, you start out just you know kind of concentrating on the activity itself, mm-hmm. and then it grows organically into a much bigger thing. And conservation and fly fishing can't be you know separated. Or just fishing oh, in general. It's yeah. not exclusive to the fly fishing oh, sure. community. Yeah. Some people think it is, but it's not. No. I'm living proof. Oh, it goes hand in hand. Yep. Mm. Yeah, we could be called the open lure, right? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> uh, one third, one <laughs> third of the, I don't know, last time you and I went fishing, there was no fly rods involved. The open crankbait. <laughs> <laughs> that might already be being done, I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah. The metaphor is lost. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> <right>. <laughs> it works. It works. Yeah. yeah. It works, yeah. Humorous anyway. <laughs> mm-hmm. So what was what was life like in, in Craig? I know that you post a lot of photographs and, and, and blogged about... Kalispell. Um, you were listening? She worked at Headhunters. Yeah. Oh, she said Kalispell. I, I was no. one of the infamous Headhunters ones. Yeah. yeah. Um, no, it was awesome. I was there just for a season. And can't say enough, just a cool group of people. I mean, it's Derek and I have been to, into Headhunters. It's a very eclectic group of folks. And I cannot say I found a better group of people in the fly fishing industry. It's um, Craig, as you can imagine, being kind of the, the epicenter, if you will, of fly fishing in that area is full of a lot of egos. And I so learned to appreciate people who can just laugh at themselves. Mm-hmm. Uh, Craig, kind of you get to a certain group of people there, and they're a very fun group of folks. They fish for the right reasons and that they enjoy it. Um, I mean, it's I had several days where myself and some of the shop guys would go work a 12-hour day in the shop, go fish overnight, and fish for some, some nocturnal action going on. I, I probably shouldn't say what exactly. Browns. And then, yeah, yeah, damn it. <laughs> They're fun. We can quack that and out. Then, yeah, everybody yeah, knows about no, that. It's, it's known. I know. Um, kind of like catching king salmon in Washington. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's true. Um, but it's it's cool because I think Craig drives a lot of people who are genu- genuinely enamored with the sport they're there because they like to fish and um i mean i was living in a place with no hot running water and the ceiling caved in halfway through the year so it's you don't necessarily go there for quality of regular life but quality of fishing life is pretty awesome Mm -hmm. so um you know learned a ton as expected and shot a ton of photos which was pretty fun I think I saw a sign there that said, don't let your kids come to Craig, Montana, because they won't ever go back home. Is that, is, is that yes. a fair way to describe it? That's, yeah, Mark Reisler said that, actually. That's a yeah. totally fair yeah. Um I worked with a couple young kids just out of, you know, high school, or just out of college, who I think are ruined for life now because they spent the summer in Craig. Yeah. Poor things. Pretty fun. A life wasted. First world problems. Life wasted. Hey, it's it's not a bad place to waste a life if you're going to do it. <laughs> I got to fish the Mo uh, last year for the first time. And, oh, uh, what'd you think? Oh, I, I liked it. I mean, I, I tend to be a smaller smaller water kind of guy because I'm not big. And sure. big, big rivers like the Missouri intimidate me. Um, oh, sure. Just from my physical size. Um, but the Mo fished great. They had just released a ton of water through the dam and the flows were coming down mm-hmm. and we got into pods of rising fish and it was fun all day oh how so. awesome you can't beat that if they're up then they're on that river if they're on they're on yeah it's great yeah oh, and it was cool. early enough in the season that we didn't have to deal with weeds and pretty but special i'll go back eventually hopefully. yeah Good hopefully place. there wasn't too much traffic for you so. no it was kind of an off time uh it was cool Right after Memorial Day weekend, so a little early in the season for most traffic. Not like peak runoff usually. Yeah, but you know, tailwaters. Yeah, that's why we hit the mo because the other rivers in the area were a little blown out. Yeah, definitely good strategy. Jess, do you have any photography projects coming up that are uh, going to document any conservation issues in Montana at all, or what's on your? You know, what are you looking forward to if you can say on, on what you're working on? Yeah, I have a. a kind of scarily busy year coming up um i just like i said i just finished a shoot in november for orvis and belize and i'm still kind of dicing those projects out so those will definitely be showing up in publications um here in the next year but i've been doing a lot of writing i just wrote a piece on the the potential smith river mine uh, kind of in the, the missouri area in that drainage that will be an american angler here 
probably in the summer issue. And, uh, I mean, all kinds of stuff. I've got a couple of striper fishing projects going on, uh, photography projects this spring. I've got a couple of trips planned out to Martha's Vineyard, which just, for a Montana kid, seems very strange and surreal and kind of novel. So, so that's fun. Um, yeah, and working with a couple of uh, nonprofit groups to do some work overseas as well, which I think hopefully will, will come through and be exciting. So just trying to stay busy and see what happens. Cool. How do you uh, how do you get a lot of your photography gigs? Does it come to you because of your reputation, or do you uh, actively go out and chase it down? It's a mix. When I first started in, um, shoot, I guess it was 2009 when I first started this thing, and it was very much me knocking on doors and saying, hey, here's who I am. Um, and in the fly fishing world, it's as, as you guys know, it's mostly a, a guy's game, and in the fly fishing photography world, it's very much a male-dominated issue. Um, so a lot of folks, I have a couple of pretty well-known editors who looked at me for two or three years and were like, you're a girl, we won't publish you, period. Um, I, I they said saved that? Emails. <laughs> yeah, I saved emails for, for, uh, irony's sake, I guess. Let's, let's so, out them on yeah. the air right now. Let's <laughs> get the scoop. <laughs> I know, I, I can't say, but it's, it's fun to now work with those editors and kind of, and they're fine to work with now, but it's. It definitely took a while to break in. There were a lot of people looking at me funny, like, well, you're a girl, you can't fish, and you especially can't take photos of fishing. Mm -hmm. It's not allowed. Um, and now, luckily, there are a couple other gals out there doing it, and it's, I'm starting to have more and more work come to me, which is fantastic. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's always a mix, I think. But, um, you know, starting to work more. I have some pieces coming out in the U.K. this this spring, summer. And that very much has been an issue of, spending time on the phone with folks saying, hey, yes, I'm a girl, yes, I fish, because they're very much, it's extremely a male-dominated sport over there still. Hmm. Um, you know, so it's it's fun. It's a mix of, of talking to people, and you just meet the most interesting people in fly fishing. I think it draws this weird, eclectic mix of all ages and experience levels and backgrounds. It's it's funny, through social media, you know, any any female personas in the fly fishing industry seem to get instant attention from you know just guys anywhere they post something oh, and totally. 70 likes and guys you know commenting and whatnot it's kind of funny they come out of the woodwork for it but if i post a picture it just gets ignored yeah <laughs> i always like them though yeah but you know uh, but the point of that is that you know a girl, quote unquote, a female in the industry can get attention just by virtue of their gender, but it, they're quickly outed if they don't have talent and integrity. So, you know, if you if if you're making it, then kudos to you because there's a lot of fly by night, well, you yeah. know. So yeah, I agree, and I have no idea what you look like. So whether you're <laughs> eye candy or not, you know, I mean, you're uh, you, you've got I talent. Know, I purposely, well, thank you. I purposely avoid the the bikini top pictures and that kind of thing it's you know it's it's less about me and it's more about the photos i'm taking and the stories of people i can tell yeah you know it's i'm kind of i'm the vehicle between whoever i'm i'm talking with on a beach in belize like this this fisheries director and the rest of the world so it's cool to kind of be that conduit and be able to to amplify and share their stories yeah do you have some bikini photos though <laughs> jesus christ <laughs> That's all I'll say. They exist. They're not coming out on Facebook. <laughs> so, Je so Jess, who are the? Um, you don't have to name names, but who? What type of voices are the ones that people should really be listening to in, in fly fishing right now? I mean, what you described. Besides us, of course. Besides us, yeah. But I mean, what, what you described, and what I, I also feel the same way, is that you know this is kind of just growing pains that fly fishing is going through, and everyone wants to, you know, make their mark and, and get their name out there. And sometimes when that happens very quickly. You, you see the wrong behaviors and you get the wrong results. So is is it just all just noise yeah. or are there definitely some voices that we should be listening to to guide us forward? Um, yeah, there are some folks. I think just in general, I'm finding more and more I'm inspired by people who are are boots on the ground getting things done. It's, it's sad but true. Oftentimes a lot of the people we see on social media and um, even in the magazines are, are very slick with words, but maybe... Uh, Maybe their heart's not in the right place, or maybe they have a different agenda. Mm -hmm. And that's, it's especially tough right now, and it's, and it's a, 
a niche market, but conservation reporting for fishing. I see a lot of pieces come through where it's do some research into the person who wrote it, and, oh, they actually happen to be on the board of the company they're uh, trying to make a hero. So it's, there's a surprising amount of, of cloak and dagger in this industry, which, again, considering what we actually do in the industry, I find ironic. Um, I mean, we're just fishing. It's supposed to be fun. But I would say definitely, you know, the the guys at TU, I've had, had mixed feelings over TU over the years, um, which I kind of hate to admit because it's I've been involved in some chapters where it ends up being a lot of talk and not a lot of action. Except for Derek's. Um, Derek's different. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We haven't, yeah, yeah. Any, we haven't done anything yet, Evan. <laughs> no. Nope. Actually, well, you've, all, you've only been talked so far. <laughs> <laughs> no, I've been, hey, I, I favorited the or the you chapter Facebook for you, Derek. So, hey. Um, but it's cool. I mean, the, the chapter here actually is run by a woman who's in her early 30s, and she's uh, she works in the women's department here at Orvis, and she's awesome. She started fishing three years ago and um, is has so much energy behind the sport and is not there's not an ego there. It's like, hey, I'm learning. Um, how can we get people involved? How can we find ways to grow the sport responsibly. Mm-hmm. And she's conservation-minded. And to me, that's been really expir- inspiring to, you know, see folks who are are maybe in that younger generation being like, hey, this is something we want to preserve. Um, how do we do it responsibly and intelligently while also wearing a flat room cap and having drinks at the bar? Mm-hmm. You know, it's, it's a fun mix of that. And I think there are a lot of good folks out there. Um, and Mark and John at Headhunters, Mark Reiser and John Arnold are some of the best guys for the sport. I think they're they're certainly rock and roll, and it's they tend to be, um, you know, folks have strong feelings one way or the other. But those guys do so much. I've seen both of them just stop and help a kid by the side of the river uh, untangle a wind knot. You know, and it's it's these little things that they help encourage people to get into the sport. Mm-hmm. Which is key. I think there are a lot of barriers to entry right now. Um, and, and folks are doing amazing things to break them. But I talk to so many folks who say, oh, I'd love to try fly fishing, but it's scary. Or I'm worried I'll look stupid. Mm-hmm. Or, you know, or, or, or. There are so many different complaints people have about it. Mm-hmm. So I think accessibility and just breaking down those barriers um, are key. The more people we can get into the sport, that's more people that conserve the resource. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. There's there's been a shift. Yeah. I mean, even you know within to you of the the more agile you know organizations mm-hmm. like the Greenbacks and the Bluebacks and the different chapters that are operating less. Exactly. They're, they're not a club. They're they're organized group of guys that are getting some stuff done and and not letting you know they're mm-hmm. they're influencing legislation and they're doing project work and they're building partnerships. So it's it's definitely the shift that's. I know, think a lot of it depends on the chapter. It does. You know, there's. Some you talk to some guys in some areas are like, yeah, I went to the TU meeting and I was the youngest one there by thirty years, and everybody there just wanted yeah. to talk. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, and then we got the younger yeah. generation ones that actually seem to be getting up and doing stuff, yeah. like the ones you mentioned. Yeah, well, you guys have stronger knees. <laughs> yeah. Your backs don't hurt. Yeah, <laughs> but there doesn't seem to be a lot of it's. It's oh. like either run by the old guys or it's run by the young enthusiastic guys so if you have one locally that's turned into a fly club for the older generation maybe you should follow in Derek's footsteps and start your own thing there's lots of there's lots of great ones out there lots of good examples of people doing it you know doing things differently so that's that's what I'm that's the model I'm following so yeah yeah let's get Mm -hmm. shit done getting shit done I got a question what it boils down to (laughs) Jess I want to put you on the spot for a second here oh boy uh oh go for it had you heard of the Open Fly podcast before we contacted you about being on the show with us? Be honest. I actually, I will be totally honest. I actually did because when I met Derek on the Mo, uh-huh. um, we stayed in touch, and he sent me a hat and some stickers this summer. Uh-huh. And so I've kind of followed along. I've been a Facebook fan for a while, so Ooh, I serious. have. I think we make like one post a month. <laughs> yeah. So okay, good, good answer. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Hey, honest answer. I can say that. Honest Perfect. Answer. She's got integrity. She has integrity. Yeah. Well, Jess, thank you very much for um, the discussion. I, you're right on with uh, what you're saying. And like I said, a huge fan of your work and keep doing what you're doing. I think you're doing an, uh, an awesome thing there. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for having me, guys. It's um, the highlight of my week. Trust me. Oh. So it's, I can't wait to. And the highlight of next week will be meeting me in person. <laughs> 
<laughs> I know, Somerset. I'm, I can't wait. I'll be the tall brunette gal. All the other Orvis gals are pretty short. So. I'll be the <laughs> perfectly average height and weight, semi-balding 30-somethings guy at the Allen booth. <laughs> All right, I'll just wander around the scene. I'll ask for people. <laughs> Wear one of your CrossFit t-shirts. I don't have any CrossFit t-shirts. <laughs> don't get defensive, dude. <laughs> Just wear a name tag. Yeah. So you'll be yeah. one of those oh. little stick on name tags. High class. Yep. <laughs> or that unicorn head that you have. <laughs> yeah. Do wear that around. <laughs> okay. All right. Oh, boy. Thanks again. Right. He's embarrassed about the okay. the CrossFit okay. comment. <laughs> well, he makes it all the time. <laughs> He's consistent. <laughs> He's consistent. Thanks, Jess. Hey, yeah. take care, Jess. Bye. All right. Hey, guys. Take care. Yeah. Thank you. Bye. <laughs> Low hanging fruit. Is Evan's what, rocking. <laughs> he's he's rocking in his chair. You might for be all the, uh, he might be Hulk Green. For right all the now. criticism CrossFit people get for bringing up CrossFit, it's pretty much everybody else bringing it up. Right. And yeah. us going, what the hell, dude? Yeah. I didn't say shit. <laughs> uh, that was the joke going around. You hear the, the, uh, somebody who does CrossFit, a vegan, yeah. and someone who's gluten No, potato. no, if it's a, a vegan CrossFitter that just adopted a puppy. Oh, is that what it is? You know? Yeah. How do you know? You're going to hear about it. Mm-hmm. They told you, whatever. Yeah. yeah. Now, which one do they talk about first? Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. what, what, do, what do you say we take another little break, uh, fill up the old water jugs, and come back and talk with uh, Wade Felon? I'm all out of coffee whiskey. Okay. Well, there's okay. ample opportunity. Coffee flavored whiskey. I think that's awesome. how I'm pouring it. We're going to be gone for like ten minutes, but you won't even know that we're gone for like thirty seconds. They're just going to put you on hold. Yeah, yeah they're going to they're going to experience the thirty seconds here while we uh, play time travel. Time traveling. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Talk to you in the future. All right. Bye. Fly two, one, three, three. three. I thought we were counting down. No, we just time traveled. How was it? I've had better. Yeah. I've had worse. Well, here we are. We are totally indifferent to what just happened the last. We're five back. Minutes. We are back. <laughs> so with us, uh, we have um, Wade Felon and Guy Olson, sir, and we're talking about issues in the Upper Missouri uh, watershed. And um, the big whole lodge today. So, Wade and Guy, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks, fellas. So, Wade, why don't you start? Tell us a little bit about um, why um, why this is important to you, your history in the area, and you know, paint us the picture of why you're starting um, this new uh, waterkeeper organization. Absolutely. Uh, thanks for having us on. My great great grandfather came over from Sweden. Uh, to work in Montana and took a couple of weeks off and rode his horse up the Big Hole River to see what was up at the top and found the Wisdom Valley, what's today the Wisdom Valley, and decided that was the prettiest place he'd ever seen and sailed back to Sweden and got his brother and their wives and uh, they were among the first homesteaders on the Big Hole River. Cool. So that's my mom's side of the family and... Uh, there's a, the fifth generation ranchers in that family are learning the trade now, my cousins, and still great stewards of the land and love that valley as much as anyone else, um, in the fishing community, but they don't fish and they will tell very few people about the lunkers they know are laying up in the north and the south fork of the big hole. Whoa, 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 whoa. no spot burning. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Good luck trying to get on the property. (laughs) Wait, we uh, we know people now, though. Now that we know you guys. (laughs) He's got them in. Um, My dad found a different way to the big hole. He grew up in Pennsylvania and volunteered for Vietnam at 17 years old, went through boot camp and went over there when he was 18. And uh, after the war, needed to go west and went out to Aspen and learned fly fishing and went to Missoula and ran security at the airport, uh, basically taught himself to fly fish on Rattlesnake Creek, wearing a white shirt tucked into slacks and <laughs> badge on. And, um, 
went back to Aspen and managed Father Gill's Fly Shop, which still exists, although I don't think Aspen's anything like it used to be in the 70s. <laughs> yeah. Um, and that's where he developed his dream to start a fly fishing lodge. So he drove around the West through Wyoming, Idaho, Montana, and wanted to pick an area that had incredible fishing, um, had a lot of diversity. And that was Wise River for him. It has five rivers within a morning's drive with incredible fishing, and uh, it's largely undiscovered. So he... Until today. Okay. One of the first fishing lodges in the West. Sorry, go ahead. No, no, I'm I'm the king of causing awkward silence. So you just <laughs> you just keep talking. <laughs> um, so he started the place in '84, and I didn't come around till '88. But I've been on the property with him since, and uh, guiding. I've been guiding for him for eight years, and um, went to college out in Pennsylvania, and started to realize that mismanagement of rivers will completely destroy a river and a lodge in Montana is completely viable now but if I want to move into a partnership and take over my father's dream and business we're going to have to protect our rivers and really look at how we're developing through the west and realize that climate change and land use management and um just the way we've handled how our cities are growing and and how people are treating not only waterways but um, agricultural lands as they're building is really affecting our future and we're at that tipping point now so before I just dove into the life of a fly fishing lodge owner which I, I love to do and plan to do um, we need to take a hard look at how we're managing our resources in southwest Montana because our rivers are the Beaverhead, the Big Hole, the Missouri. Um, we go over to the Madison um, and Upper Missouri Waterkeeper, which we'll get into, is looking at not only those rivers but about 13 beautiful trout streams in that watershed. So anyway, backing up, um, when I got out of college and started working at the lodge full time, two th two reasons I went to law school. One, the winters are incredibly lonely and long in Wise River, Montana. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, two, working at on these watershed issues at the ground level is gr great and and in some ways uh, noble, I guess, for the groups that are doing it, like. Mike Bias with the Big Hole River Foundation and um, Jen Downing with the Big Hole Watershed Committee, but at some point you need legal advocacy. And I went to law school, and I got out of law school in May of this year, but over a year ago, a ski team buddy of mine was... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you guys said you love the fly fishing BS aspect of this show, so buckle up. <laughs> go, go for it. Go for it. I, I skied for Bucknell Ski Team, and because the Poconos don't offer anything like the Northern Rockies, it was mostly a drinking team, and one of the best on our team was a guy by the name of Jay Tuck. And he happened to go to law school in Vermont with the Upper Missouri Waterkeeper, Guy Altenser. And I blew my knee at uh, the reunion in 2012 in Salt Lake. And I was sitting in a hot tub, bummed out. I'd spoken with a surgeon, and he said, there's nothing we can do till the swelling goes down. So if you're nowhere near home, might as well enjoy your day and uh, wait for the swelling to go down try to keep that thing elevated. So I'm sitting in a hot tub with one leg up talking about law school, and uh, this guy happens to be an attorney. He graduated about six years ahead of me at Bucknell, so I never knew him. But he was involved in water rights in Salt Lake. And I told him about my passion for fly fishing and the lodge and the issues we're facing in southwest Montana, and his eyes lit up. And he said, you have got to contact my buddy Guy. 
This is yeah. a conversation between two men in a hot tub? <laughs> <laughs> Just, there were women. There were women, I swear. With a leg up or something? What the hell is going on? Uh, we'll okay. trust you. Carry on. <laughs> uh, he said, were guys we? in Pennsylvania <laughs> working on water quality issues on the Susquehanna River in the Chesapeake Bay, but his dream is to move out to Montana and help your state with your water, water quality issues, specifically in the upper Missouri Basin. And now my eyes are lit up. So I gave Guy a call, and sure enough, he's out in muck boots in his family farm field helping his father irrigate and uh, said, yeah, this is confidential information at the moment, but my plan is to incorporate a 501c3. I've got all the paperwork done, and I'm doing it. I'm moving to Bozeman. I'm packing up my little hoopty truck and coming across the country. So graduate law school, and let's keep in touch. And fast forward to November of this year, I came on board as the program director of Upper Missouri Waterkeeper, and we are moving and shaking. We plan to really help the southwest corner of this state in terms of its water quality issues. At, at its root, we plan to save the fisheries from um, the lack of knowledge of the water quality issues that they face. Yeah. Very it's good. such a destination area that <clears throat> aside from, you know, a greater understanding by people around the rivers, the, the guys that use the rivers every day, they got to be really uh, careful about how they use the resource, I would imagine, because you could, you could just over hammer those, those rivers with the number of people that come to that area to fish. And if you've got water quality issues on top of that, then uh, that could become a real significant issue. Absolutely. Wait, wait what, do you, what do you think is going to be the biggest, um, the biggest paradigm to shift? Is it with the developers learning how to do things differently and be more, um, I guess, aware of how they're developing? Or is it going to be the, the ranchers and the landowners who have to be a little bit more adaptive in how they're managing what they currently have to, to help you reach the goals that you're looking for? Yeah, this is Guy chime in because Wade just gave me the thumbs up to get technical with you. Uh, that could be a twofold answer, guys. I, I really think it needs to be both. We need to have sound private land stewardship. People that, uh, like you know, Wade's family, have owned big swaths of land and these important headwater tributaries to the Upper Mo. They need to be doing it right. And uh, you know, sometimes they don't know what the best management practices are. So on one hand, yeah, we got to help and outreach to them show them what tools are available to use sound science to protect our fisheries, to protect our landscapes. Mm -hmm. But on the other side, southwest Montana's booming. Uh, city of Bozeman, for example, is, you know, we're, we're approaching 45,000 people within the, the city limits. Fifteen years ago, that was down half of that number. Uh, our river valleys here are booming like no other region. We have some of the fastest growth in the American West. And with that type of growth, comes transformations in our land use and uh you know a lot of the impacts of that are our riparian areas our uh, streams our creeks our landscapes uh, and and population pressure all these things put a lot of pressure on what used to be a really well-balanced ecological system that supported big lunkers and pigs and uh what do we got now is uh you know something that looks far cry from that so we got to work on both the angles of what are the cities doing what are those city officials doing on the other hand, reaching out, helping local landowners be good stewards, educating them on the issues, uh, and along all that, making sure we understand uh, what the heck we need to do, right? Using sound science to guide decision-making. I think in uh, over a year doing this show and uh, how, how are we, we're at 24, 25 shows now, mm -hmm. I think this is the first show where the word lunker has been used. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm from Pennsylvania, and uh, I was telling this story to Wade the other day. It's like, I didn't know what the heck we're talking about with fancy fly fishing and <laughs> your patterns. I was like, what the hell is a pattern, boys? I, I know what a lure is. I, you know, I can't pronounce lure or water right. You know, I, I admit what's <laughs> actually going on. But let's be honest, like, he, he's at a whole other level. I'm still thinking spinning rods and catching smallmouth bass, you know? Don't worry. I'm going to educate him on all that. No, you're fine, dude. Just keep doing what you're doing. <laughs> You know, it, se it seems like that they ought to, someone ought to write a movie or write a book and then write a movie about a young kid that leaves Montana and goes to the East Coast to, to school, become a lawyer and come back home. And did they already do that or? 
You know no. something about that. <laughs> I don't know. The part about that is my father drove me up to Whitefish and put me on a train my first year to Bucknell. <laughs> I, my... I, I just hope he gets cast with a good-looking actor, right? Come on now. <laughs> So not to make I was a movie about in that. the Western Cafe on Main Street in Bozeman uh, about a week ago, and they've got a 36-inch rainbow mounted with a little plaque that says 1977 caught by Doc Jones or some, some name on the East Gallatin River. and um, 37 inches? 36. And 36? It's, That's steelhead size. <laughs> it's massive, and the thing is, so deep, just gorgeous looking fish. Lunker. And I we say girthy. <laughs> it's girthy. <laughs> deep. Is in fact a lunker. Yeah, and there uh, it is again. we don't have that fish in the East Gallatin anymore. In fact, we've got E. coli and nitrogen and phosphorus and oil and gas and grease and um, all I think, I think of- you need to get more cattle hanging out in the banks. <laughs> Is what you need. <laughs> yeah, is that is that stuff coming from residential development, commercial? Is it from agri? I mean, Municipal, agriculture, yeah. just mining? What is it? Um, just a broad scope of, of Derek. Sources? It's cow shit. Sorry, <laughs> just cow shit. Oh, well, no, nobody <laughs> wants cow shit in your rivers. Uh, well, well, when we're looking at at least the East Gallatin, you're just looking at a landscape that's been completely transformed. The East Gallatin, uh, you know, is essentially the upstream main stem, if you will, of the galley itself. Uh, and, and this river has had its upland headwaters completely taken over by development, whether it's suburban sprawl, whether it's uh, forest land that used to be intact, it's been cut apart for ranches, or maybe it's just uh, straight up, you know, a lot of impervious surface in terms of people not planning out what the heck we're going to do. We're going to put a Walmart right in the middle of our huge wetland that used to provide some natural filtration capacity. Uh, So what we're talking about is death by a thousand cuts for the East Gallatin and its headwaters. Right. So, uh, you know, what do you do about that kind of stuff? Those are the type of problems that Wade and I are looking at here. Yeah, yeah I think for this area, a lot of people are seem kind of detached. Uh, this area, like the Seattle metro area, which we're, we're a little far away from. You know, we're all 20 miles away from it. But uh, people don't just feel removed from that kind of thing, and, and they don't understand how development and stuff affects the streams. And they see these streams that they've seen, you know, for the last 10 years or whatever, and they're just full of silt and everything. They thought this is how they've always been. But you talk to some of the natives of the area and they're like, yeah, I used to see salmon and steelhead in those rivers 30 years ago. And they used to be rocky and, and have some gradient and they start putting houses around them. And next thing you know, they're just muddy sloughs and they just kind of, that's the transformation they take when you take out that natural filtration. So well, what we have out here though, too, is salmon drive everything when it comes to land use and development. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, there, a lot of the salmon are endangered species listed. And so that legally drives development and you don't have, you know, an iconic fish like that, that, that drives your laws. The trout that you have in the Montana rivers, I mean, obviously there's they have some paddlefish. native species, but what you what you guys need is a uh, you know an endangered species fish to <laughs> to change the course of your That's development. Really, big hole river. Well, we got yeah, we got okay. the grayling on the big hole, and you got the pallid sturgeon at least up north of Fort Peck on the upper Mo and the Breaks area. But you're right, we don't have the endangered species protections for what's going on, and uh, at least from our perspective. We don't really want to get to the point where we have, uh, you know, total population collapse and having to deal with, you know, this bullshit scenario of some sort of, uh, you know, federal law having to come in and ratchet down the controls. We think Montana-made solutions uh, are the real answer here, that educating people first and foremost is going to be key about what the issues are and what they can do. And then secondly, uh, you know, making sure that we have not only a good system of rules that are actually on the books, and incorporate science, but then enforcing them. You know, you guys, uh, when we, we had talked a little bit earlier, you asked Wade, what do we hope to you know, do here? And one of the big things that we're real keen on is, you know, it doesn't behoove anyone to work on trying to sue the little guy or shut down a local business. What you need to do first is make sure that we have great rules on the books that incorporate practical common sense and use science, and that guides our decision-making. And then once you have them on the books, you make sure that our decision makers and government actually enforces them. Mm -hmm. This is a proven system of rules that works. It protects our fisheries. It protects our culture. It protects our outdoors. Uh, Montana, more than anywhere else, has everything to gain by using this system. 
and by enforcing it. And if everybody plays by the rules, well, then guess what? We've got a great economy. We have an outdoors-based economy, in fact. We have superb fisheries. Uh, we'll have communities that have strong businesses that want to locate here because people want our quality of life. But more than that, we'll be able to do the things that we've always wanted to do and, you know, swimming holes. You know, you, don't, you want to go swimming in the summer when it's so hot out there and it's just steaming? Well, guess what? All that can go away in, you know, one breath of a summer if somebody allows a big bunch of subdivisions to come in that put a bunch of nitrates into our groundwater and create, you know, algae blooms. We don't want to go down that path. So first and foremost, we want to focus on making sure we have good rules that are practical, common sense, use sound science, and then let's make sure we actually use them. It works. Yeah. If, if, um, fair warning, dealing with this in Washington, uh, getting people to accept sound science is a major uphill battle. <laughs> if, if, it doesn't, if, it, if it doesn't jive with their preconceived worldview, uh, good luck with that. <laughs> it's tough. Yeah, well, we both Wade and I joke about this a good bit because we're, you know, we're lawyers and uh, we went through law school. And law school has a way of screwing with your head and making you see the world black and white when 99% of the world is not lawyers, thank heavens. Uh, <laughs> so so we're, we're, we're looking at that and trying to think, you know, what's the practical value that uh, an organization like Upper Missouri Waterkeeper can bring for Southwest and West Central Montana? And we really think it's a lot about changing that cultural mindset and that that's not something you do overnight. No. You know, the first step in that is by having a couple key examples of here uh, uh, is proven pollution issues that are affecting things that you, local Montana citizen or resident, give a crap about. Mm -hmm. And this is what we can do to provide a solution to that and help you speak up for your right to clean water, for fishable water, and for a superb outdoor, uh, you know, recreational opportunities. Mm -hmm. That's the starting point. Yeah. yeah, if it works, come out here and help us with the hatcheries because because uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, right now we, we have a bunch of steelhead hatcheries that are doing just nothing for the rivers, like not even getting the hatchery fish returning back, but there are people fighting tooth and nail to keep them. Mm -hmm. Like, well, you, you put more fish in the river, you'll get more back. It's science. Actually, no, that's uh, anti-science, but go ahead. <laughs> well, so, you know, you guys uh, have a long battle ahead of you. You're just getting started, and you may not change the old school way of thinking right now, but you can, like anything else, educate the younger, more progressive people, and that's where the change will come. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we definitely agree with that. And, you know, when we're thinking about challenges, we thought of three things in particular that uh, would make a huge difference in Montana if we can succeed at these. And one is, just like we said, the Montana mindset. Maybe you can't change the old timers, but you can educate the youth. Uh, if you show youth uh, a, a beautiful brown trout and, you know, get them out on the river and let them see clear, cold, bubble stone bottoms, and then they see, hey, this, you know, has good, you know, invertebrate, and we get our bugs out here because this is a great riparian area, and then in turn the fish love the bugs, uh, they make that connection, and that'll stay with them. Are you uh, saying so that kids kids make a connection to, to fish <laughs> and stream life? Yeah, I'm not saying that they're ever going to take their eyes off their iPad the rest of the time, but, uh, you know, I do think they make the connection between that when you, you lay it out for them and you get them out there and you show them the fish, you show them the bugs, uh, they do make that connection. you got to help them, but uh, we get there. Yeah. And that's what we're about, helping the, the youth become educated about what's going on. But, uh, you know, completely separate from that, we have a system of rules, like I've said before, that's never been really enforced. Montana never had to worry about this stuff. Uh, you know, not only that, we, we had a population. We just reached a million in this huge, huge-ass state. So there's something to be said for the fact that we're not just changing mentality of families or people we're, we're having to change people's mentality about the fact that yeah we live in a really special place uh and it's worthy of protection but the time to act is now um and, and we think that by using those two angles by doing a lot of outreach a lot of education but at the same time is by being unrelenting advocates that use sound science and speak up for our rights as citizens to have the right to, you know, legal protections that protect our right to have a healthy fishery, to right. have clean water, to be able to get outside and recreate. That these are things that not only Montana law, but federal law has promised us 40 years ago. And, uh, you know, that promise is still unfulfilled. So on a real intellectual level, we're, we're fed up with the idea that people think they can just stomp on that. No, the time to act is now. The time to be proactive is now. Let's protect our resources before they go down that slippery slope. Yep. I agree. Yeah. Yep. You, um, we, we've had some other 
conservation groups on in the past that represent, you know, world-renowned fisheries like the Madison River Foundation and the Henry's Fork Foundation. And one of the challenges that popular watersheds and fisheries have is that you are a destination for world-traveling anglers to that area. And so you have... You know, you, you need the voice of more than just the people living in southwest Montana to help, you know, with your cause. You have potentially exposure to a, a big voice outside the area, you know, the people that come there to fish. And you have, you know, celebrities of a wide variety come to that area to fish. Do you, do you want to invoke the power of a celebrity level voice or do you want to become a local voice um, in favor of the upper upper Missouri? Are you offering Scarlett Johannesson's number? <laughs> well, I have it, yes. Well, okay, email that over. Okay. <laughs> Love her in the boat. Um, yeah, no, Montana is a state of mind um, like so many other incredible fisheries around the world like bristol bay and uh, new zealand and argentina southwest montana well like your steelhead waters i'm my dad just started teaching me how to uh spay cast and i've been swinging a fly and watching these guys in sleds come blaring up through the rapids and dragging out steelhead right in front of where i've been fishing for three hours but it's a state of mind you know they're there whether you ever see them or interact with them, knowing that there are wild steelhead um, in the, oh, I can't pronounce the name. I was out in Oregon last year. Derek told me to stop in South the Deschutes. Deschutes. It's pronounced Descahooties. <laughs> <laughs> but knowing there are wild steelhead in those rivers is good enough for my soul, and you guys are fighting that fight. And for our clients of Big Hole Lodge, knowing that we still have the grayling in the upper reaches of the Big Hole River, or we still have native West Slope cutthroat in uh, in the Big Hole, and we're losing them throughout the rest of the watershed, that that's a call to action for the people that don't live right here in Montana. And I agree, we just got a million people, so we need help. We need outside help from angling, um, from celebrities, from conservationists, and more than podcasts, ours. you need help from podcasts. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The fish need the voice. And let me break it down to something that's real tangible for everyone. Uh, think about the scope of the Upper Missouri River Basin. The Upper Missouri River Basin is over twenty-four thousand square miles. That's from the headwaters of the Galley, the Madison, the Big Hole, uh, Red Rock. You know, we're talking the Centennial Mountains at the border of Montana, Idaho. The headwaters there, all the way up to the confluence of all those rivers, uh, where it forms the Upper Missouri, and then the Upper Missouri main stem and its tributaries, all the way out past Great Falls to Fort Peck, uh, Fort Benton, rather. We, we we work on water quality issues throughout all those different sub watersheds, and again, trying to bring together the importance that the problems that each one of these watersheds and their fisheries are facing, they're not unique. We're facing these problems in this real special river basin, which is the headwaters of the longest river in the United States. And, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're fighting an uphill battle, like you guys have said, but it's also one of the most worthy battles. So when you say, do you want to be local or do you want to draw outside support? I say I want both. I want to have my pie and I want to eat it. Uh, and, you know, it's the most worthy cause of all. We got these killer fisheries. We want you guys to come out here. We want to share a beer, sit on the raft, uh, you know, pull out some lunkers. And, uh, there you know, it is I again. Want I can't help it. Pennsylvania. <laughs> so there's lunkers. There. Yeah, so what can we do? Yeah, what can, what can, we, how can we help? Well, first thing anybody can do if you want to help is become a member. It's critical to become a member of, of small nonprofits like Upper Missouri Waterkeeper. Becoming a member, it's not just the fact that, you, you know, whether you pay $35 in a due or whether you pay, you know, 350 bucks or 3500 uh, Every cent goes towards literally making sure that Wade and I can use law and science and education and outreach to spread the word about the importance of clean water, to challenge the status quo, and make sure that we're making smart decisions about not only how we grow, but about what we do and how it affects water quality. So first and foremost, become a member. But uh, secondly, 
check out what the heck we're doing. We, we put a lot of time and energy, believe it or not, into our website. We updated about what we're doing. Uh, it's part of our, you know, the, the kids these days, they're online all the time. So we try to put out the message as best we can about here's what we're doing. Here's the relation to making sure that clean water is a reality, not just on one river, but throughout an entire river basin. So keep tuned, spread the word, join as a member, uh, and give as you can. Nice. Can our podcast become a member? Absolutely. Heck yeah. Yeah, UpperMissouriWaterKeeper.org. Nice. Are you guys a listed beneficiary with 1% for the planet? We're not, but I'm driving up to meet Craig Matthews here when he gets back from his 1% for the planet talks, and uh, we plan to be. Cool. Very nice. Yeah. Bitchin'. <sighs> that's pretty inspiring from my perspective. I mean, yeah, yeah you guys are passionate. You know, mm-hmm. Hear it in your voices for sure. Yeah, chill out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you might just end up doing what you want to do, and well, that would be, you know. You can't have that. Can't have that. <laughs> Nobody likes enthusiasm. I know. <laughs> so what what remains the biggest roadblock to you that you're going to have in, in getting this done? You talked a lot about education and outreach and you know winning over the minds of the community. Is there you know what's the biggest hump you've got to get over? I'm sorry, say the question again. What what's the biggest challenge we've got to get over? Yeah, yeah, what's the biggest challenge that you see in getting the way of, of getting this done for where you want it to go? Oh, big, well, I'm gonna I'm gonna speak on my part as someone who's been fighting the fight using law for six years and last two years in Montana, uh, it's that our system isn't in, you know, we got a good bunch of rules, but on the whole, the rules aren't enforced. And it, it's half political uh, and, and it's half just, you know, bureaucracy that just doesn't want to do what needs to be done. We really need to make sure uh, that we're, we're spreading the word that rules are not red tape. Rules protect our right to those things that we enjoy most, whether it's fishing in your favorite stretch of a, of a creek, or whether we're talking about swimming, or whether we're talking about you don't want to pay a ridiculously high wastewater treatment utility bill for living in a city. It doesn't matter. Having good rules on the books, making sure that they're enforced consistently, and that those rules reflect sound science, that is the biggest hurdle that Montana has right now, is that we've never had to worry about those three characteristics. And that's what our nonprofit is really starting to engage in, is that we're seeing widespread trends where, uh, you know, there's this tendency to say, well, we've never had to deal with that, and, yeah, we get the science, and, hey, we'll even give you that uh, we should put stricter rules on that reflect sound science and protect fish, but you know what? We're going to create a big old loophole, and don't worry about it. You don't have to do anything for 20 years. You know, we just don't buy it. Uh, We think that the law says otherwise, and we think common sense says otherwise, that what we're looking at here is changing the way we do business. And how do you do that? Yeah, you do the education and outreach on one side. The other side of it is, You be an unabated advocate for water, and you stand up for your legal right to have clean water in Montana. Yeah. There you have it. Yeah. It's a hell of a tagline. Nice. (laughs) Should we let them go? Yeah, it sounds like that that energy needs to be put up in a bottle and taken out on the street. That's Mm -hmm. very nice. (laughs) Yeah. Hmm. All right, so once again, tell us how uh, our listeners can contribute, what the, uh, what's the website, what's the Facebook page, and then we'll let you guys go out there and start the fight. So search Upper Missouri Waterkeeper on Facebook, and you'll find us. And I want to reiterate that the Upper Missouri Basin is not just the Upper Missouri River, but it includes every one of its headwaters, tributaries, and their tributaries. And um, all of those are compounding the problems that you're seeing in Craig on the Missouri River with algae and loss of bug life. A lodge owner last week called me and said in the three years he's been there, he's seen a decline in the hatches outside his door and an increase in the algae blooms. Um, So, again, we're looking at why that aggregate problem is occurring throughout the entire basin. So, anyway, UpperMissouriWaterKeeper.org to join us become a member, help us better direct our decisions on what we're going to engage in, and give us your stories. A lot of you listeners have fished all these streams out in Montana from the Dearborn up to the Big Hole, and we want to hear. Uh, Historically, have you noticed changes? Do you have questions? You can follow us on Instagram at um underscore waterkeeper. Uh, We have a Twitter. It's umwaterkeeper. 
but uppermissouriwaterkeeper.org will take you to all those. Cool. Sweet. I can see right now on my map or that your Facebook page that says you're 550 miles away from me right now and 548 people like your page. So let's... Let's up that. Let's yeah. up that a little bit and show them that you're show them that you're listening. And if you send them a donation or become a member, send us an email and maybe we'll put you in a raffle for things. Yeah, maybe we'll even match it. Cool stuff. Maybe. Yeah, we might. Hmm. I'll think about it. Okay. Well, come out and fish with us too. I'm. I'd love I'll be to. Lodge all summer. My father and I will be guiding. Um, Bigholelodge dot com. I'm not on the river. I'll be in the office with Upper Missouri Waterkeeper. Cool. Nice. Well, I got to say, the big hole is has been on the my bucket list for several years. We came through there about four years ago, and uh, we had we had intentions of fishing it, and we brought a a deluge with us from the coast, and we, the river was blown out, so we had to fish the beaver head. Um, <laughs> with everybody else, huh? Yeah, everybody else. So, big hole is still on the bucket list. Mm. Well, it's on. Uh... 50 places to fish before you die is bucket list this weekend on Sunday on the World Fishing Network. Oh, hey. Is the, the Snoqualmie River that runs by our studio here on there? <laughs> <laughs> Talk to Conway Bowman. Yeah, oh, yes, should I be. saw him on video on the front of your boat for the river. That should be a pretty interesting segment then, huh? Yeah, it should be cool. Good. There's a guy by the name of Chris Santella who wrote a book called 50 Places to Fish Before You Die uh, worldwide, and then he wrote a book called 50 More, and World Fishing Network picked up both those books to run uh, season. So this mm-hmm. year's season is 50, and the next year will be 50 more. Awesome. 50 episodes? Uh, <laughs> so we're episode two, and I know it's a full half-hour episode, but I would assume they're doing 50 in a season. Awesome. Yeah. Well, that's mm-hmm. Ambitious. Cool. Right. cool. All right, thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Yeah, great, uh, great show. Thanks guys. for... Coming on. You're having fun. Yeah, see you, this, see you this summer. <laughs> we hope so. Cheers. Right. Take Bye. care. Bye. Wow, those guys care about what they're doing. Yeah, absolutely. I care about what they're doing. I do, too. All right. Raw I can just see myself right now sipping a beer on the front porch of their lodge this summer. That sounds pretty good. Road trip? <laughs> Road trip. Cool. That sounds pretty good. Yeah. Well, they, boy, they got they got a fight ahead of them just because of the, the vastness of that watershed. Mm-hmm. But they can do it. Um People care about that place, mm-hmm. that greater area, mm-hmm. that southwest Montana. People need to start caring about the rivers here. Yeah, Everywhere. they do. Yeah, maybe we need a lower Snoqualmie water keeper group. <laughs> 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 Going back to that the, frog thing you were talking about earlier, <laughs> or the toad. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> hmm. Well, well, there are anadromous fishes that come through. There, there, there is are. a robust population of sea run cutthroat. There are. Yeah, but they pass through here. And they just yeah they they roll by. Yeah, on their way to wherever it is they go. I know there's a big roadblock up there. You so. could also you could flip that around. I mean, you can't those fish can't get out to the ocean unless they get through, you know, where the river dumps into the sound. So that's yeah, and that's, that's where that's, most that's of the as problem. Much the exit gate as it is the entrance gate. Well, most yeah. of the problem our anadromous fishes have they are saying is in the Puget Sound somewhere. Yeah. They don't really know what it is. The outbound. Yeah. 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 The rivers are. I mean, these rivers right here are not in that bad of shape. Mm-hmm. As, as you know, in the grand scheme of things, the mm-hmm. spawning waters. I mean, the, even the Snoqualmie it only has a couple spawning tribs, but I mean, the, the Raging River, Tokel Creek, the mm-hmm. the Tolt, all those are they're not bad. I mean, they're not silted up. They get they're rocky. They got good spawning water. Yeah, there are native and wild fish in there. And yeah, and develop, there development is carefully monitored mm-hmm. now, mm-hmm. right? You know, until there's... people start throwing a bunch of money at some politicians, and that might change. Yeah. yeah. But they've kept, like, you know, last week when we were having flooding, people were whining that they had to close, close one of the two bridges out of town down. Like, well, why don't we just raise this up and, and make it so it doesn't have to close down? It's like, well, you, you put that, I mean, it's on a dike, and, you know, you raise that dike up anywhere, that water's got to go somewhere. They, and people are just like, I don't care. They I replaced won't. that bridge 10 or 15 years ago, mm-hmm. whatever, and when they had it shut down, they did raise the lowest sections of that road a bit Mm -hmm. so that it would clear out after a flood a day or two earlier than it did historically. Right. But, but it was clear at the time it was farmland preservation and, and, and flow management, Mm -hmm. you know, yeah, you dam that up and you're trying to funnel a gigantic flood into one little space is what people don't understand. Mm -hmm. Like, well, I don't like that. I 
an inconvenience for two days out of the year. Move back to Bellevue. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, you know, the other side of the river is just a mile that way. You could absolutely move there and we won't stop you. Yeah. There's got to be some sort of ancient Chinese wisdom about building a house in a floodplain. <laughs> well, not people yeah. building on the floodplain, just people that commute across it, you know, and there's still that one bridge on the other end of town that's always open. Yeah. But and people are like, well, they just need to redo that again and make it so it doesn't close down. It's like, so you're willing to shut down that road for an entire summer. So next year you're not inter- you're not inconvenienced for two days. Mm. They, well, they just miss, miss the that co- logic. The cost is astronomical. The fact of the matter is people are so disconnected from yeah. the natural world. And they how don't, and they don't there. care. You yeah. tell them like, well, it's going to mess up spawning. It's going to mess up the farmland. It's going to mess up fish passage, like everything mm-hmm. like I don't care. And that's why those type of people are the ones that need to be educated about right. conservation issues because they don't care. They don't grasp it. No. And, well, some people are not very easily to ed- easy to educate. No. They, they they pick their worldview and anything else is wrong. Yeah. I think that was important with what Wade and Guy were saying was that, yeah. okay, that's the reality. I'm not going to go to your front door and, and introduce myself and tell you, here's the name of the organization I'm working for and here's the work we're trying to get done. Mm-hmm. Would you please help us? Sometimes you need to come go there with a piece of paper that says we're enforcing the rules. What you what you think doesn't matter anymore. Yeah. Right. We're we're enforcing the rules here. So that just that that reminds me that there's a potential next show issue. The next one that comes on is talking about this very same issue on the bitter root. Oh, so, we already have that booked. Well, I don't. So if oh. you live on the bitter root, if you guide, if you're an outfitter, if you're a developer, if you live in the community, um, there is a big issue on the bitter root right now with um, the floodplain. Um, rules changing so that now people can build on the fringes yeah. of the floodplain. Yeah. So, and that river system is so dynamic that you know you you, you have water in, in one place one year and the next year you don't, and then the next year after that it comes mm-hmm. back to twice as twice as you know much. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So let's see if we can get that on. That's a pretty important issue too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, Big time. and that's yeah, know. yeah. I'd, I'd definitely like to see our local rivers bounce back because yeah. they they got potential. I mean, they're close to development and everything, but. Yeah. Skycomish, Skycomish especially, is pretty damn intact. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, it really is. It's, I mean, for as intact as that river is, it's pretty shocking that it's not just booming with an azurous fish. Yeah. Yeah. It should be, because all that spawning water is, except for there's one, there's a Proctor Creek that's near that rock quarry that kind of got screwed up. But, I mean, that river's in awesome shape. It'd be nice if we could figure out those fish that go out and, and don't come back what's stopping them. Yeah. yeah, and we just got a new director of WDFW named as well, the guy from... Idaho. Is it going to be better than the last one? Ols- Olsberg. Guy from Idaho? Idaho. The last one's solution for everything was hatcheries. Yeah. Well, people from Idaho, they understand uh, fish and game. Hopefully, yeah. that'll help us. We'll see what happens. Yeah. The ones here understand hatcheries. Yeah. <laughs> well, but there's, but the, you know, the, there's rules, just like we're talking about. There are rules that need to be enforced. and so well, we don't have any enforcement. Yeah. We I mean, have legal. We have legal enforcement. Well, the, the entire, I mean, the county that starts just a mile north of here, Snohomish County, pretty much put a moratorium on all fish and wildlife violations. Said, we're not going to prosecute them anymore. Yeah. So if you want to go poach a bunch of fish, go to Snohomish County, Washington, everybody. <laughs> yeah. Because they will not do anything to you. Well, if they shut the hatcheries, all that wasted millions of dollars could be put towards uh, enforcement. <laughs> Ooh, wait. That makes sense. That sounds science, isn't it? Yeah, that's not really how we like to operate. Yeah. Mm. I don't know. That's frustrating. So let's keep that on top for heads. I mean, we talked, we opened the show with a little bit of sarcasm about, you know, the number of shows that we're doing, but I, I'm comfortable with doing impactful shows it's no matter how many times they happen. Quality over quantity. That's right. Yep. Yep. I mean, like, you know, we haven't really explained fully kind of how we're, we're changing. You know, a year ago when we first started, it was, okay, we're going to do three or four shows a month and we would pick our schedule. It'd be like, all right, we're going to do a show next week on Thursday we're going to do a show the following week on Tuesday we're going to do a show on Wednesday the next week let's get guests for those shows mm-hmm. now we're finding guests and then booking a show that suits them so mm-hmm. instead of trying to force it and i think that's a a way to get better shows as opposed to doing two or three okay shows with one good one thrown in we'll just be cutting out the mm-hmm. although you know in defense of our early shows they were all good I did like it. No, I absolutely. I just don't think that was sustainable. No. Yeah. Plus, Derek oh, couldn't see, afford. That's, the, my, that's my word. You can't use that word. Derek oh. couldn't afford the gas to get. That's here. our word. <laughs> that is our word. <laughs> now the gas is two bucks a gallon. I I can't afford it, but yeah. still, <laughs> Jesus. Yeah, yeah. Derek's got what is it? Thirty minutes for you to get here. I, I'd rather not drive twenty five miles 
you know, yeah. if I didn't have to. But Kirk's got a downhill commute, about a whole mile. Yeah, yeah. but I'd use a lot going back up the hill. <laughs> yeah. I get to drive down, I mean, I get to drive down the river corridor, and I see the water, and I see the development, and I see the farms, and I, I see the flooding. So it's inspiring to drive up here because it just helps me focus on, you know, what, why we're doing this show to begin with. So yeah, that's what I'm protecting right there. That's right. Shit flows downstream. That's right. Indeed. So if you're swimming, sometimes it's better just go downstream because if you turn upstream, then the shit's coming right at your face. That's true. Don't swim with your mouth open. One of these days I want to float the rest of the Snoqualmie. I've only floated Let's that. Let's do it. Up, I've only floated that, the actual gradient section where it actually seems like a oh. real river. Let's you build know? some wooden rafts and go from Duval all the way out to Puget Sound. <laughs> we should. <laughs> well, uh, I've, I've been on a lot of the lower sections. In a motorboat. And, and in a kayak. And mm -hmm. I recommend a kayak because if the wind's blowing upstream, it'll be blowing harder than the current that flows downstream. <laughs> so with, at least with a kayak. I've got I a can, canoe. Well, canoe is good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can row canoe. Right on. Let's do it sometime. Mm. Yeah, we'll take a cooler of beer. Yeah. Let's get pledges, people. You know, how many river miles can you float? <laughs> I, bet, I bet if you weren't stopping and fishing, we could go from Fall City to Duval in a long summer day in a canoe. Yeah. Yeah, you could. Uh, It'd be a long day. Let's stand at paddle boards. Yeah. No. No, never. Come on. Um, no. It's a good core workout. I mean, it's perfect. I don't need a core workout because CrossFit. <laughs> there there are some I don't know if you knew this, but I do CrossFit. Yeah. So There are some areas uh, through the Chinook Bend area and whatnot below mm -hmm. there where there's some woody structure in the river. You probably have to portage. Does it go across the whole river? Uh, depends on the, maybe not last year, but maybe now. Maybe. Who knows in six that, months. That was another thing about that last flood is that, you know, with all of the, the restoration work they did there and they built up those those nice piers and, Mm -hmm. You know, it did do something that it was supposed to do during that last flood, which catch, great, catch woody debris, catch woody debris, and and you know mm -hmm. naturally control the flow of the river versus having to channelize it and rip mm -hmm. rep walls and straight runs. Yeah. But even then, people were like that didn't do what it's supposed to do. Look, we still had flooding. <laughs> oh, <laughs> forgive us for having lots of water. Yeah. Forgive us for having six feet of snow. Sometimes that, these problems just don't get fixed overnight. Six feet of snow that melted in in a day. Right. Yeah. These yeah. Don't you know. get changed overnight. Yeah, people just don't understand how how things work. Well, here we go getting instructional. Well, we're telling them how to make the rivers. Now. We're informational. informational. Yeah, we're that's not true. teaching them how to do anything. No, that's true. Just, yeah, no. We the Snoqualmie floods a couple times a year. You mm -hmm. know the, the the western slope of the Cascades is one of the rainiest and snowiest places on Earth. Mm -hmm. So sometimes you get several feet of snow and then it warms up to fifty five degrees and rains on it and it all comes down. It all comes down. It's got to go somewhere. Can we snorkel on that trip? On the Absolutely. Oh, Do totally. some river snorkeling? Sure. <laughs> See some brown trout? There you go. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if that'd be the most exciting stretch to, to snorkel, but man, let's give it a shot. Well, I predict a couple of sunburns at least. Yes. <laughs> well, not with a wetsuit on. Wetsuit? Yeah. Jeez. Oh, yeah. It's going to be 85 degrees and the water's going to be 60. Oh, I guess down there in the upper stretch of the Sky Comish, I, was, I thought I could tough it out. Really? Well, I put the wetsuit on. I didn't put the hood on. This is before I found my triple XL uh, neoprene hood. <laughs> Let me tell you, when you get into 50 some degree water, even with a full wetsuit, your head gets really cold and you end up with a headache in about 30 seconds. Did you wear flip flops so your feet didn't get hot? Or no, I had, I had uh, scuba booties and, booties. Uh, and uh, some, some fins. Hmm. Yeah. How, how many thick, uh, millimeters thick was your neoprene? Uh, that was only a five. I'm going to be getting a seven here soon so i can go snorkel and look at the wild steelhead in the late winter inches, please, quarter yeah, inch. for a matter of comparison how thick is the average koozie for a beer can eighth inch 16th yeah mm. i used to dive with a quarter inch can you wetsuit. convert to american math please that is american math no math of millimeters <laughs> oh, damn. anyway math yeah the when the water gets low during like march april may you know you have times of low water i, I want to get up to the upper stretches of some of the local rivers and Mm. snorkel through and see some of them big wild steelhead we don't get to fish for. Mm -hmm. I've seen people doing it. They just mm -hmm. heading downstream, snorkel up, fins kicking. Off yeah. they go. Yeah. I like to go upstream. You start at the bottom of a run and kind of crawl your way up, and you come up behind the fish. Mm -hmm. Against the flow? Well, you go up along the sides. So you, if you go up along the side, you can kind of look and see everything before swimming right over it. So you kind of look over to the side and see all the fish hiding and everything, and then you get up to the head of the pool when it gets too soft, and then you kick off into the current and float back down. Over the deep part. Ooh, that sounds cool. It is cool. Sounds magical. It is. It's it's a whole. Can we get some open fly podcast um, wetsuits made up? Sure. Only seven hundred dollars a piece, everybody. Ouch. Nice. Somebody has to have it lined with. Uh... <laughs> get some wetsuits. No, I, no, it, that's like one of the things that 
They don't discount. They don't. <laughs> no. Well, well, maybe just like a onesie that are like a brief. Like a onesie <laughs> brief. <laughs> a no, bo- it's a Borat onesie. if you if you do have if you do have rivers near you that are relatively clear, uh, I, it's something I really recommend that you do. It's 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 eye opening to really see how things work underwater because it's it's I guarantee you not at all like you think. Like the way I've always imagined the dynamics of of how the fish interact with everything underwater is is was been pretty often i've been on rivers my entire life until this last year when i actually got down and swam with them yeah when i, I could actually sit on the bottom and, and feed rainbow trout out of my hand you know it was, it was cool fish, don't, fish don't feed whisperer. the wildlife evan oh, i'm sorry fish i mean it's, it was like the equivalent of like throwing bread to ducks yeah they just kind of swim up to you and take it well when i was you know when I was first doing river trips, that's the way that I learned how to be on, you know, you gain your right to get on the boat by being willing to swim through a rapid. And if you can't swim through the rapid, then you have no business being on the boat. Correct. So. We would snorkel through the rapids. We'd go up, you know, to one run, go up to the top, go through the run, swim through the next rapid and, and go through the next pool, too. Mm-hmm. You know, it's just part of learning how to do it. Yeah. If you if you don't know how to do it and you're out there one time and accidentally go through a rapid, that's a bad time to learn. Yeah, it is. Because then you're going to panic. Baptism by... Fire? Fire. Only it's not fire. It's water. It is. Earth, wind, and... Uh, uh, anyway. <laughs> that's whiskey talking right there. That's whiskey talking. We Pretty. should we should end this show now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. I'm well, going to take this new Xteris pack with me for the uh, fundraiser. Evan, thank you very much. That's a good-looking oh, logo, at Xteris. Awesome. Yeah, 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 who made that? Did you uh, sign that, Kirk? I might have. Nice. Mm-hmm. Full circle. I like that. That's, yeah. that's a nice big yeah, hug right there. Yeah, everybody knows that I... I'm one of the the dudes on staff at Allen Fly Fishing running things, and we're doing a soft goods brand now of packs and clothing and things like that. And the first official Xterris products on the market are these new packs. And I have to say that um, the zipper pulls on these things are... The, if you get them for one reason, it's the zipper pulls. The funnest I've ever seen. Cool. Think so? Absolutely. Well, they're, they, they, they're form-fitting to your fingers. That, that's why I like it. Yep. Nice. They, they they're like ergonomically they, correct. They look like they're strong, and they're going to work, and then they're not going to break. Yep. So. Ex Terras. Ex Terras. Well the done. Greek god of outside frolic or something like that? <laughs> no, it's a it's a alternative you like ex ter is the either Greek or Latin I can't remember now. Uh prefix or prefix for anything outside, you know, like exterior. Mm-hmm. And, and so the us is collectively ex, us. Ex, yes. So us outside? Sure. Get outside yourself. Yes, exactly. There you go. Yeah. I don't know. I thought it sounded pretty hardcore. That's nice. I like it. Yeah. Very good. Good looking pack. Well, you can win this when you come to the uh, fundraiser on the 21st at the Brick. So mm-hmm. okay. I'll be selling raffle tickets as a fundraiser. And if you don't win, and let's be honest, your odds of winning this are pretty low. You can just go buy one. There you go. Which goes right to my paycheck. There you yeah. go. Cool. Yeah. All but right. that doesn't mean you shouldn't try to win it. You should. There's to be some great prizes. Mm-hmm. Who else uh, Who else donated to your cause? Oh, man. I've got, so I've got a couple different local guides that donated guided trips. So there's three guided trips. Uh, Orvis Recon Fly Rod. Um, I got lines coming from scientific anglers. I've got um, uh, a number of the fly shops in the area donated fly boxes with flies in them for the upcoming Squala Hatch. Um, cool. I've got t shirts and hats from Rep Your Water, guests we've had on the show. Um, Cutthroat Leaders, I and mean, gosh, there's there's a lot of stuff. So, books. Yeah, and books from all of the Wooly. Bugger. 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 Yeah. So it's been great. The community response has been awesome. So cool. Off we go. That's awesome. That's awesome. All right, now I get to spend a few hours editing the audio, and we'll get it online for everybody. Good. Once a month, quality is probably less is. work. I, I know there's, there's been some audio issues on this show, so I'm going to have my work cut out for me. Uh, well, Hopefully none of them make it to the final product. You're the man for the job. Yeah. Cool. Just so everybody knows, this doesn't magically just end up online. There's work that goes into this, damn it. There's probably math that goes into this, oh, too. God, math, is math. math is hard. Math is hard. All right. Yeah. I'm well, out. Well, Kirk's getting out of here. Yeah, see you. Later. Bye. Bye. Okay.